Hey, I'm Laura Schreiber, and I'm here today with Steve Corona from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm Laura. I'm doing good. How about you? I'm good. Thanks so much for joining me today. So, Steve, why don't you tell everybody why we're here? What are we going to talk about today? Well, we are here to talk about public domain books and, and turning them into audiobooks. And what is a public domain book? So, public domain is uh, any book that is older than, what is it, 100 years old? I can't remember the exact age, but it's an older book that now the copyright on it has expired, and so it's in the public domain. So anybody can take it and uh, do what they will with it as far as um, recording audiobooks and using the characters in them and things like that to write their own stories. Correct. That's exactly it. So if a book has been published before 1923, you are free to narrate it. So you can go to places like Gutenberg.org. You can Google them. Any of these places are great sites to find books that are in the public domain. So why is it that people like you and me want to narrate public domain books? Well, um, a couple of things that, that are nice about public domain books is because it's in the public domain, you don't have to ask permission. You can just go ahead and, and make your own book. And what that does is it just, it creates another opportunity for you to do work and to get it out there. And you can put it uh, up for like royalty share so that you can be making a little bit of money on it when people purchase your version. Uh, so that's just another little added income stream. And it just, it keeps you busy and keeps you sharpening those skills. And I'll tell you something, um, I don't know about you, but for me, as I'm trying to round out my repertoire and make myself more versatile to people who might cast me, it allows me to say, hey, I'd like to do a book in this genre and I haven't been cast in that yet, but let me do a public domain book and show like I haven't been cast for any history books yet. So I've done public domain history books. So now I can say I've done this history book. Have you done anything like that for yourself? Well, I just barely started dabbling in public domain, and uh, we could talk about that a little bit more here, uh, my experience in uh, trying to get started. <laughs> what have you found are like the essential steps in producing these first public domain audiobooks? Let's talk about that. Right. Well, um, first of all, thank you, because you were one of the sources that I used in trying to produce my first uh, public domain book. Um, you had referenced, of course, Karen Cummins uh, on the Narrator's Roadmap. And, and then you basically kind of did all this extra research and wrote your own blog post about it. And I, I went and I read that. I saw it because I saw your video that you were talking about it on Instagram. And then I thanked you. I said, oh, thank you so much. This is great information. So I just basically followed along that. And so it was just a matter of finding a book I wanted to do that was in the public domain. So I went to Project Gutenberg, found a book that I wanted to do. Um, and then I, I started researching, like, okay, how do I do this? I had to create the ebook. I had to, you know, uh, create the, the cover and add a little bit of my own material, right? So I wrote a little introduction in the beginning. Um, and then I had the text from the existing book. Uh, and then I was going to narrate it, but then we ran into a hiccup. Yes. So this hiccup is a big deal. Tell us about the hiccup that you ran into. Right. So I learned that apparently if you would like to do a public domain book that already has several versions, several copies of it in existence. Um, I don't know if this is recent. I was talking to Karen Cummins about it, and it sounds like this might be more of a recent development, that they are no longer allowing you to produce certain books if too many versions already exist. And so I wanted to do Edgar Allan Poe's The Raven because yeah. I thought, well, it's a short story. It might be something easy to start with. Thank goodness I didn't put too much work into it, but it was still a good process learning how to do the ebook and everything. And so by by doing that and submitting it for approval, Amazon came back and said, sorry, too many of these already exist. Even though your material, you have something in it that differentiates it, it's not enough. And there are too many of these versions out there. So we're going to have to reject it. So that's what happened to me. Which is so frustrating. And imagine like, I can't remember if it was something from 9-11, but I had actually looked into doing some political content and it was like 30 hours long. And that's why ultimately I didn't end up doing it. But it was the same thing. It was a political domain work. It must not have been 9-11 because that's not public domain. Or maybe it is something because it was like, it fell into the criteria in a different, but anyway, I was looking into right. something that was public domain and there were like a hundred of them already. So I decided not to do it, but, um, I'm really glad because it was like 30 hours long and I would have been so upset if I had done 30 hours of finished audio and then they came back to me and said, don't do it. So 
for those of you who are like me and like Steve and are thinking of putting yourself out there and doing some public domain narration, beware and maybe try to find something that's a little bit less popular and be a little bit creative. So some takeaways from this. First, um, when Steve was going over the steps, there's another step. He mentioned the ebook. So first, you have to create a Kindle ebook version that you're narrating. And in order to do that, you have to create a separate username or email account. Um, so for example, if my regular email is what I use on ACX, I've created a rights holders account. And I have a blog that details this and also Steve mentioned Karen Cummins narrator's roadmap. She also goes over these steps there. So you can go through those steps there. Um, but the main takeaway is look for something that's unique. Find something that maybe resonates with your passions that's unique to you and maybe 30 or 40 or 50 other people haven't done. Maybe there's only four or five of and Amazon won't flag. Yes. Is there something else that you wish you had known when you started this process? I mean, I think that's the main thing because, yeah, there, there are some steps involved. Of course, it takes some legwork. It's not super easy. But once you go through the process, you realize, oh, okay, it, it's it's doable. It's doable. And so I think um, that was one thing going into it. I was very cautious. I was kind of nervous, like I don't know what to expect. But having done it, I realized it's not really that bad uh, compared to just producing any other audiobook, right? Uh, there's a lot of work involved there too. It's just different steps. So I guess um, – not necessarily things that that uh, I, I wish I had known. It's just more realizing that it's not so bad. And I think I'll stick to shorter titles at first until I get the hang of it. Like you said, I don't want to be putting 30 hours into an audiobook and then realizing that there's something wrong with it. So I'll probably start small and work my way up uh, is my strategy. So I think so. And I think that there's a lot of opportunity to be super creative. Like you could do compilations of multiple pieces. Right. You can combine things. You can look for combinations of, uh, for, for example, for me, I'm working on something now where I'm combining public domain art with public domain writing. Mm -hmm. um, there's some different and unique approaches that you can have depending on the genres that you're interested in. Um, it's kind of this idea of people always say, like, what would be your dream job? What could you cast yourself in? So when you think about the public domain work, you're casting yourself. This is your chance to cast yourself and, and to say, like, this is how I, I can represent myself to people who are casting me. But you don't want it to be for naught, right? You don't want to put yourself out there, spend hours, spend time that you could be going after bookable work and have it go nowhere. So, I mean... Our time is valuable in many ways, so you want it to go somewhere. Well, thanks, Steve. So if people want to find you for, for booked work, for other ventures and voiceover, how can they reach you? Well, probably my website might be the best place. So it's uh, coronaproductions.org slash audiobooks. Great. And I'm Laura, and I can be found at lauraschrivervoice.com or at laura at volaura.com. Thanks so much for joining me today, Steve. <music>